changing minds, changing attitudes is underwritten by the Arkansas Mental Health Research and Training Institute. Hello and welcome to Healing Minds, Changing Attitudes. I'm your host tonight, Jancy Sheets. On this program, we are going to take a look at post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, in adults. PTSD is an anxiety disorder that can develop after experiencing a life-threatening event. 7.7 million Americans age 18 and older have PTSD, according to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. So join us tonight as we explore the causes, symptoms, and treatments. During this first hour, we will feature a documentary, Long Road Home, followed by our live panel discussion. And you will also have the opportunity to ask questions and make comments. Stay tuned for Long Road Home. Funding for this program was made possible by the Staunton Farm Foundation. Thank you. I'd never seen a, a dead body before I went to Iraq. And there's, there's a guy laying there with easily like 15 to 20 bullets in him. Five dead and five wounded. I felt like it was my fault. We would kill them by the hundreds. When these veterans came home, the war came home with them. I think about it every day. It's almost like a little movie right in your head that's, that's playing over and over. The sights, sounds, even the smells of battle have left their scars on generations of veterans. Scars our parents and grandparents rarely mention. I didn't talk about the war at all. For years, I, I would not tell anybody I was a Vietnam vet. But in recent years, men and women who've served are finally talking about the emotional wounds of war. The public looks at you as a, as a war hero. If only they knew that I'm still fighting a war within myself. It was hard for me to verbalize when I got home. And I'd be in the middle of the night, I'd wake up hollering. Pretty much one destructive behavior to another. Uh, suicidal ideation. I come home and uh, alcohol tastes like water. I had homicidal ideation. I'm messing around with other women. I needed to do something. And so they did by taking a step not enough veterans are ready or able to take. Today, retreats for younger vets are showing great success in healing. And you might be surprised. It brings back. Memories. To go inside this PTSD support group for veterans of World War II. You remember things like they happened yesterday. That feeling of brotherhood, that feeling of being with those who understand you and accept you, is tremendously therapeutic. It's going to help read your brain waves. We can monitor their sleep, sleep patterns, activities of their brain when they're sleeping. Now, there is new hope through promising research, better treatment. And thanks to veterans who are serving their country yet again. I'm really passionate about helping other veterans avoid the same pitfalls I do. By reaching out and helping others. I just still don't feel I'm at home yet. As they travel a long road home. My name is Anthony Canzanari. I'm 25 years old, and I'm an Iraq war veteran. When I looked at myself two years ago, I was embarrassed at the person I saw because I was, you know, going down a really wrong path that I that I promised myself I never would. You know, using drugs and alcohol. I had a DUI. I'm divorced. I was a homeless veteran for a while and really running from my problems instead of facing them and, and overcoming them. Tony Canzanieri sees a different man in the mirror today, but he's not afraid to reflect on the darker times, the trouble that hit hard after deployment, the challenges that started long before the military. Especially being, you know, a high school dropout, a child of two substance abusers, and, you know, growing up 
extremely poor. After finishing ninth grade, Tony quit school and worked to help his family. Still, he got his GED and started working on an associate's degree at a community college. He had a steady girlfriend, too. We were best friends. We did everything together. We never wanted to be with anybody else. It was the best relationship you, you could ever imagine. I actually got married uh, two weeks before I left for Iraq. Tony had joined the Army for the benefits and the pay. He soon found the stability he'd never had moving from home to home in small towns south of Pittsburgh. Because I was a really, really undisciplined person before I came in, and I was kind of one of those look out for yourself type of people, definitely. Everything you do in the military is for the people on your, your left and right. And I learned that really quickly, uh, became disciplined really quickly, and, and got in you know really good physical shape as well, which kind of changes your outlook on, on everything, I believe. I was assigned to an Iraqi police battalion, so I trained Iraqi policemen to be policemen, and then I was also acted as a liaison officer between the U.S. forces and Iraqi forces. Tony's experience in Iraq was not remarkably different from many others who've served. He lost friends. Unfortunately, I had two friends that were, that were killed in Iraq, uh, one of them by his own hand, and then the other was uh, killed by a roadside bomb. He was always on alert. And just living in that constant hypervigilant state. He saw death. I'd never seen a, a dead body before I went to Iraq. Not, not even a well-preserved funeral dead body. I'd walk over to the truck, and there's, there's a guy laying there, easily like 15 to 20 bullets in him, in the back of the truck. Where's he at? Well, left or right, sir? And he took somebody else's life. The first time I used the weapon, it was you know, a very you know, traumatic experience for me. I was a, a gunner on, a, on the top of a Humvee. There was an insurgent on the side of the road that had taken over a police checkpoint, and he was in the police uniform and then pulled a weapon and was going to shoot at, at one of my fellow soldiers, and I, I returned fire and killed the insurgent before he had a chance to injure any of us. I did what was right in that situation, but unfortunately what's right isn't always right with you. I was a different person after I was forced to use my weapon. Then another trauma. Six months into his tour of duty, a non-combat injury sent him back to the States. It was a gunshot wound right above my kneecap, and the damage was pretty significant. I returned back to Fort Bliss, and I was having issues. I was drinking too much, and I was having nightmares, and I couldn't sleep ever. But I didn't want to tell anybody because I wanted to, I wanted to stay in the military. I didn't want to do anything that would jeopardize my career. But the leg injury was bad, and that meant his military career was over. After they found out I wasn't fit for military service, it was a period of maybe 20 days that I, you know, I processed out of the Army and I was back in, in Pennsylvania, so it was, it was that fast. My entire adult life, I was a soldier. That's, I mean, that's, that's all I was. That was my identity. And then after I got you know, a little bit banged up or something like that, then I wasn't a soldier anymore. As soon as I got back to Pennsylvania, all my symptoms got worse. Tony was still troubled by having killed an Iraqi insurgent and still having nightmares about the dead. Whenever I think back on, on seeing that body, I can still remember it. It was just like just like yesterday. Everything was, you know, hyper vivid colors. It was, you, I could smell, I could hear everything all over again. I still see it all the time. His marriage was in trouble too. Tony and Chelsea were having arguments. Tony says he started them, usually over little things. I would make it into a huge fight. And then it always kind of blew up into she would not understand me and, and but didn't take any didn't really take any steps to try to understand what was going on with me. Things would get worse. Even though they were newlyweds, Tony started cheating. At this point in time, the marriage is pretty bad. Like we had, uh, I was messing around with other women and, you know, again, staying out and drinking all night and stuff. And when we got together, I wasn't that type of person. So I came home a completely different person, and she wasn't happy with who I was now, and I wasn't happy with who I was now. But not unhappy enough to get help. Tony was destroying his marriage, and now he was destroying himself. Yeah, I overate a lot. I was, you know, I gained about 80 pounds in, you know, the six months after I left the military. <laughs> The anger got even worse, and then I started drinking to deal with. I, if I was drunk, I didn't have nightmares because I'd you know, pass out. I had a lot of prescription pain pills that were you know, prescribed to me for my injury, but I started abusing those pills. And all I did was just jump from one you know, destructive behavior to another. 
and I realized that I needed help. I needed to talk to somebody. I needed to get my experiences and my feelings out in the open instead of just keeping everything bottled up because I was ready to explode. many things before it was called PTSD. Shell shock, battle fatigue, war neurosis, soldier's heart. You can go back probably to the beginning of time, but nobody ever talked about it. When somebody came home from war and was disturbed, the way it was treated in the past was, get a job, you'll be fine. Nothing wrong with you. You'll get over it. Uh, Fourth of July, you can go in the bedroom, here's a bottle, have a couple drinks, you'll be okay. Dan Ziff has treated veterans with combat-related stress for nearly 30 years. He's the clinical coordinator of the PTSD clinic in the VA Pittsburgh healthcare system. Everyone comes home from war changed. You can't go through war and not have some profound experience that happens to you in a war zone. To the effect that that experience impacts the individual's life, that's where we come in. One of the biggest challenges, getting them in the door to begin with particularly men, there's this stigma. If I ask for help, I'm less of a man. In my mind, that would have made me a weaker soldier. When in reality, asking for help actually is a tremendous sign of courage and strength. So this is to be expected when you come back and you just have to live with it. My wife screwed up. She was throwing down ultimatums. My boss is screwed up. You know, lost my job. My friends are screwed up. All the guys on the street are screwed up. I'm perfectly fine. A study by the RAND Corporation called Invisible Wounds of War showed that nearly 20% of all military service members who returned from Iraq and Afghanistan, about 300,000 in all, reported symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder or major depression. Yet only about half went for treatment. Among the most common reasons veterans gave for not getting treatment, they were concerned about the side effects from medication. They felt family and friends could help them cope, or they worried that getting mental health care would hurt their careers. People in my unit wouldn't trust me anymore because if I can't even control my emotions, how am I gonna help them in battle? And, and then the other thing is that I was worried of having like a, a crazy stamp on my, on my permanent record. And so they keep quiet, which for some troubled soldiers is the worst decision of all. Another RAND study called The War Within reports that in 2001, there were 10 suicides for every 100,000 military men and women. By 2008, that number had risen to 16. Between his drinking and survivor's guilt, Tony did have suicidal thoughts. He never acted on them, but by this time, he did have a DUI and his marriage was in serious trouble. My son was born at the height of the worst trouble that me and my ex-wife were having. And we had decided to get divorced already, but then, you know, I'd make the same decision I guess a lot of people do, and we tried to stay together and work it out because we were having a child. You know, through the drinking, she was there. Even after she found out I had cheated on her, she was there. But the cheating and drinking continued. The marriage did not. Me and my wife gotten divorced, and I came out, and I ran into some financial issues, and I didn't know how to do it, and I was embarrassed to ask for help. I didn't know who to ask for help from. And so Tony ended up homeless for more than a month. And so I would sleep in my office, or I would sleep in a car, I would shower at a friend's house. I, I'm very good at surviving. Well, you know, last time we talked about me trying to push myself and get Dan up. Ziff has counseled thousands of service people during his years at the VA. He says about 15% are forced into treatment because of total breakdowns or trouble with the law. But most take that important step on their own. Something has happened that has shaken their awareness where they can't be in denial any longer. For Tony, it was the memory of his parents, who he describes as substance abusers. He didn't want his son, Dominic, remembering him the same way. Where's the ducks? 
I took a good look at myself and like my parents and what I had come from and realized that I was going to be the same thing as, as everything I didn't like about, about them. And I just didn't want my son to grow up embarrassed of his dad like I was. Oftentimes, someone who is younger, who's just coming in, um, will still have their emotional armor up. And so the staff at the PTSD clinic helps veterans work through those emotional barriers. Veterans may have false notions or fear about what goes on behind closed doors. I don't think I've shared my story. But in most cases, the healing is simply in the talking. We may have a cup of coffee, review what's happened since the last session, what they're working on, how they're feeling, what blocks they feel they may be having, some ways that they may be able to get over those obstacles. The symptoms of combat-related PTSD are usually divided into three categories. Hyperarousal, that's usually the first thing that we see. Being angry or too aggressive, having panic attacks, being hypervigilant, having exaggerated reactions. A box along the side of the road when we're driving home, they may swerve across three lanes of traffic to avoid that box because they might think it's an IED, whereas you and I will drive right past it. Other symptoms can be classified as intrusive, things like nightmares, flashbacks, distressing memories, feeling anxious or fearful. Oftentimes, these veterans live very quiet lives of isolation. And that's considered avoidant behavior, loss of memory, feeling detached, restricting emotions, losing interest. They don't want to be in large groups. They don't want to go to the shopping mall. They're perfectly content living lives of invisibility. By now, Tony was living alone in small apartments in and around Pittsburgh. During that time, he made the life-changing decision to get help. I waited two and a half years to really talk to somebody. And whenever I did talk to somebody, I wanted to jump in with both feet and, and really make some significant strides. And he did at the VA in Pittsburgh, seeing a psychiatrist or counselor several times a month. Just hearing the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder was a big step. Now it, it had, a, had a name. It wasn't just like a, a phantom anymore. Whenever I realized that my symptoms were part of a disorder, it kind of made me feel a little better because I realized I'm not crazy. You know, I'm not the only person going through this. This is a normal reaction to, you know, the crazy things that we saw. Music was one of the initial things that the, the, the VA psychiatrist had recommended to me as an outlet. I didn't take her advice for a while and then I started playing guitar again. Whenever I picked up the music again and started writing again and, and playing, I felt really good and that's where I go now. But Tony is about to go much further serving his country in a way he never expected. When they come into treatment, I say, there's no one better suited to appreciate the light than someone who's experienced darkness. And Tony would also learn there are generations of others who've known that darkness too. I'll get you back to the medic, pal. Don't worry about me, McGee. Take care of yourself. It may seem unusual to see an older couple reading a comic book. 20 years old. But how many veterans can say their wartime Man, actions were immortalized like this? This is me, supposedly here. It was created in the late 50s. Come on, man, let's take them. An era when a black hero would be drawn as white for thousands of American kids who bought heroic comics. We've been used to a lot of, a lot of uh, racial stuff, you know, back in those days. But Fred McGee's anger over the misrepresentation has long since faded. Now at their home in Smithfield, Ohio, Fred and his wife Cornell are paging through the past. Here's a good dose of lead poisoning. June of 1952, Korea. McGee took command of his platoon after his squad leader was wounded. He fired at the enemy and held off machine gunners as his troops moved up Hill 528. Here come the mortar round. I saw one coming, the first one that I got hit with. So the lucky explosion I got hit here in my chin and right here in the temple with the more shrapnel. 
Though injured himself, he pushed on, and on orders to withdraw, McGee voluntarily stayed behind to help evacuate the dead and wounded. So I picked him up on my shoulder, and I started running out with him. His heroism earned him the Silver Star, two Purple Hearts, and other honors. But Fred McGee is a reluctant hero, and even more reluctant to talk about his emotions. He never discussed the war. He never talked about it at all. But the only thing I remember him say was, I don't want my boys to go to war. My boys will never go to war. This was a bad war, you know, we were in because you didn't know who you were fighting. You're scared to go to sleep, you're scared to eat, you're scared to wake up. Like many Korean War veterans, Fred McGee came home, got married, had a family, and went on with life. Nightmares were the most obvious sign of trouble. And he would wake up at night and arms flailing and hollering. Well, I was dreaming the mortar rounds were coming in, and I was running, trying to hide behind anything. The and the only reason he's talking more openly now is because of help he got in recent years through group support at the VA. You don't think you need it. You know, you're a tough guy, but down the road somewhere, you're going to need some help because of the things you've seen and things that you've done. You don't, you can't do it on your own. I respect them greatly. Seeing older veterans still in treatment might surprise some people. And to be so open and vulnerable and respectful of each other. But what's not surprising is the reason for being so open. Our ship was torpedoed three times. And then trusting us enough with their stories. That night. Telling their stories to help future generations. That's an honor for me. I volunteered for the paratroopers immediately. I was flying to the 101st Airborne. We went into Normandy, Holland. We, we went into the Battle of the Bulge. But we were the spearhead division of 94 through Patton's Army. Patton's Army, Normandy, the Battle of the Bulge, Iwo Jima. It landed on Iwo the same day they put the flag up. This is a support group at the VA Pittsburgh for World War II veterans with PTSD. Ann Dietrich is leading the session. Battle fatigue, that, that was what they called it back then. Post-traumatic stress disorder was not a diagnosis until the 80s. Men in this room actually lived what the rest of us only read about in history books. And I was sitting out in the water when they were dropping the bombs, the A-bombs. Yeah, I served in the Army Air Corps as a ball turret gunner performing missions out of England over Germany and occupied Europe. I thought that was going to be the end for me, and it was island after island, and we won them all. In the 1940s, these men returned as war heroes, but they came home at a time society felt the normal thing for men to do was get on with their lives. When the World War II veterans were discharged from active duty, there was really no outpatient therapy for them. And I think many of them would say that the most important thing for them would have been to be able to talk about their experiences, to normalize their experiences, to accept their experiences. I kept it all inside for years, and then I reached a point where I never drank unless I was alone or with somebody. <laughs> the laughter might surprise you, but that's the thing about these World War II vets. They know there are times to smile and times to support each other. He was killed by a jab sniper, and he was right beside me. Mr. Foley, you remember these things like they happened yesterday, and I can tell you have a lot of emotion about that. How I lived after I came home, got married, had a family, built my house, and so forth. Yeah. These fellas never had a chance to do that. And that's why I keep thinking about them. But they were uh, lucky to have known you, that's for sure. People wanted to make statements in the group today that would honor their fellow soldier. They didn't want their friends to be forgotten. 
Ann Dietrich, may I help you? Ann has been with the clinic since it opened in 1989. That's when Congress authorized specialized PTSD right. programs and the Pittsburgh VA received funding because of the region's high concentration of combat veterans. I had three Pazooka men killed right after the under me. Does anybody else have those thoughts of, you know, why me? Why did... How did I survive that? You While the know? symptoms of combat-related PTSD back are similar in all generations, older veterans face some unique challenges. They're at the period of their life where they're reflective. Why did I survive and the, these people did not? Was I worthy of their sacrifice? Did I do enough with my life? One of the most difficult things occurs when they lose a spouse. That is very disorienting for this population. They have a lot of physical limitations. Some of them have to use a walker. They're on oxygen. But despite all of that, they really make an effort to come in here. My rank was Staff Sergeant. My serial number is 491610. That's something you never forget. <laughs> Walter Popatak joins his fellow vets in the World War II PTSD group that meets every Thursday. He's 87 now, a very different man than the 18-year-old who left Pittsburgh's South Side to join the Marines in 1942. Walter spent three years in the South Pacific. He was a forward observer, part of the frontline troops directing fire on the enemy. He saw some of the worst combat of the war. Being a forward observer, we would kill them by the hundreds. We saw the results when we went and moved up, you know. You'd see them, parts, parts of the bodies all over, everywhere. He saw his friends fall around him. Myself, I know carrying some of the guys back and what they were crying, don't let me die, don't let me die. I want to go back home to my girlfriend. And I still hear that today. Yes, yes, that's still with me. Walter remembers the jungle and the times he had to kill with his own hands. It would be at night most of the time because we would be in foxholes and then we'd set up little wires with tin cans. If there was a noise, that meant somebody was coming in after you, and you you weren't allowed to fire your rifle then. You had to do a hand-to-hand -hand combat, and first thing you had to do is hit him with the butt of the gun and knock him down, and then, you know, uh, finish whatever had to be done. It, uh, it just... I never told anybody any of this, so... Uh, but it... It wasn't something that you want to talk about, really. And uh, it works you up. Uh, but uh, you can see there's tears coming in my eyes from just talking about it. But like most veterans of that era, Walter came home and didn't talk about the war. He got his old job back at the Isley's Dairy in Pittsburgh, dishing out ice cream, trying to fit in. I, I found it difficult to get along with people that I'm either going to kill somebody and get the company in trouble and so I said I think I'm just going to find another job. Most of the jobs that I got after that were where I'd be off by myself. Walter would not marry until 1957, 12 years after the war. He and Eleanor would have children and grandchildren. Still, he shared only a few war stories and never discussed the bad things. I would have uh, nightmares of the Japanese coming into our foxholes at night and finishing them off. She moved out of the bedroom because I would be swinging and fighting and embarrassed more so than anything. And uh, I, I didn't want to tell anybody what was happening and felt, uh, you know, they wouldn't understand it. But in 2005, while working through the veteran's system to finally get his Purple Heart, Walter found out about the PTSD support group for World War II veterans. 50 years after the war ended, he signed up for counseling and still remembers the first time he spoke. It was bad. When Ann called on me and said, just get up and tell them who you are and what the branch of the service you were in and some of the spots where you were. I got a nosebleed. During six years of treatment, he's opened up, made new friends, and looks forward to Thursday mornings at 10.30. They are like me, 
and went through what I went through. At home, Walter enjoys life more, confides more in his family, and is starting to share more about the war. This is a picture of our outfit when we were all together, and I'm right here. And while he may be softer with his emotions, when it comes to giving advice, Walter Popatak is still a pretty tough Marine. You, you never give that title up. I'll be a Marine until I die, and they'll bury me as one. Look, there's only one way to do things, and that's the right way. My story here, I hope it gets down to these young fellas that are coming back today from the war and that they go and seek the help that's there for them. But don't wait around like I did. I waited all these years and it just ate at me. If it's broke, get it fixed. are ringing at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Pittsburgh. You hear the chimes, Dan? Yeah, I hear them. Always saying prayers, keeping prayers going. And every ring of the bell symbolizes a prayer sent out to a lost veteran. The chimes are for prayers for the dead. It's a windy day. They're praying, they're praying every second. These three friends, all Vietnam vets, enjoy meeting here. Mark Sutton. Oh, they're like my brothers. Dan O'Grady. It's a constant reminder. And Pat Conroy. I see a lot of memories. Pat is executive director of the memorial. The statues come alive, and I look into their eyes, and it makes a connection to me. It reminds me of the friends that have died in Vietnam and the people that I haven't seen in 40 years. The statues were designed to convey a warm welcome home. The memorial's dome is an Asian symbol of rebirth. Marvelous. You know, it's, it gives us some recognition and some of the recognition we never got. It might bring back hurtful memories, bring back emotions that they haven't felt for a while. Others bring back a joy that they have recognition, have validation for their service. But for Dan O'Grady... I come here whenever I can. This place speaks to a personal war that long outlasted Vietnam. I was happy. I was for life. I had no idea what Vietnam was back in 66. It wasn't at all on my radar. I was worried about girls and going to the dances and, and getting a beer. And I was just getting into trouble constantly. So at the suggestion of two buddies, Dan joined the Marines. Six months later, he was in Vietnam. The first thing I thought was, man, is it hot here? And the smell. The military smell, the tents, the diesel, the trucks, the airplanes. It was like walking on the moon almost, as far as being in my culture and then going to their culture. It didn't take long for Dan to see that. It was my first day out in the field. Incoming rocket fire killed three and wounded one in Dan's company. I'm telling you, those rockets come in and I was so scared. I'm thinking, Oh, no, I got to be here for another year and a month. On another mission, Dan was on point, the man walking out front. When he sensed an ambush ahead, he refused to go up the jungle trail. Two of his buddies went ahead. And I was only 10 feet behind him, and the whole jungle opened up with gunfire. Five dead and five wounded, and uh, I felt like it was my fault that I wasn't verbally able to keep people from going up that trail. Dan still has a photo of his friends. Thanksgiving Day in Vietnam, two months before that ambush. It, it just tore me apart, uh, losing Waylon and Gunny and Burgett, Paul Tellis and Paul Davis. It was like, I'm done. I, I don't want no more parts of this war. I don't want to make friends with anybody else because I knew if I liked somebody or loved somebody, actually it was love, 
that they would get killed and I would be hurt again. The rage I don't think I ever was able to bury, and, and the rage came from that ambush. I had uncles in World War II who would say to me, well, that wasn't any war we were in. And that was the sentiment among many Americans as Vietnam vets came home to indifference or scorn. Dan was home by age 20 and taking drugs his first week back. At the worst, LSD, speed, and marijuana. He drank every day from morning till night. Till the money ran out or till the bar closed. Any girl that I was with, I, I mistreated, I cheated on. Dan became verbally and physically abusive with his girlfriends and later his wife, Terry. Yes. Yes, Dan hit me. You know, more than once. He's hit me more than once, yeah. But I've always forgave him. He wanted to hurt somebody, and I was the closest person to him, so he could hurt me. And you always hurt the one you love. I didn't know that this rage was in there for a reason. Went out a couple times. Terry and Dan remember the turning point. It came in 1983 when Dan had violent flashbacks of a dead Vietnamese child and saw his own daughter in the girl's face. At the VA hospital, the doctor's diagnosis would not take long. I told him that I was having thoughts of homicide and suicide and I just want to kill somebody. And he says, well, anybody in particular? And I said, no, but how about if I start with you? Initially in the 70s, when Vietnam veterans were coming back, the psychologists and the psychiatrists were referring to it as post-Vietnam syndrome. They weren't sure what was going on, but they knew it was something different. Dave McPeak has been helping veterans with PTSD even before it had that name. Back in 1980, he was the focus of a Pittsburgh Press newspaper article about the city's new vet center, where Dave was seeing a spike in what was being called delayed stress. A Vietnam veteran himself, Dave had earned a master's degree in counseling psychology. This is the job that I was made for. I knew I was home. This, it just kind of really fit. He was among the first in Pittsburgh to get Vietnam vets into group therapy. They were agitated had sleep problems, flashbacks to the war. If they were with their buddy when he was killed, it was their fault. So they would creatively blame themselves for these traumas over in the war. Trauma is acute, unfinished business from the past. That's what post-traumatic stress is in our view. There are now 350 vet centers in the U.S. welcoming veterans from all conflicts. The centers are essentially community extensions of the VA, offering some of the same services in a more personal setting. Get them in the groups as soon as possible. It is remarkably effective. The first session kind of frees them up that they're not the only ones. Dave has been setting up his group sessions for more than 30 years now in rooms where a soldier's most personal thoughts are shared where friends are remembered, where lives do get better. With that support, they are able to make it back into the world, living in the here and now. Now retired, Dan continues his counseling and is very active with Veterans Affairs. Our life has completely changed since Dan quit drinking and since he started going to the vet center. She's very loyal. She took a lot of grief from me, but yet hung in there, and, and she knew that someday I might be something other than what I was. And he just needed help. And Dan has someone else to thank, too, his Vietnam veteran friends who support each other, who eventually found a peace that was a long time coming. That's how it should have been when we came home, open arms and wasn't quite that way. But beyond their bravery in Vietnam, these men did leave another legacy. What America learned from their emotional misfortune is now helping other veterans today. I'm Paul Dordell. I'm a chaplain in the United States Army. 
that uh, entails uh, counseling, uh, being with soldiers, providing moral support. So the chaplain is sort of the, the front line uh, counselor, you might say, especially in the combat theater. Wherever the soldiers are, the chaplain is there. And Chaplain Paul Dordell is there for his fellow soldiers once again. He's agreed to take part in a first-of-its-kind study. Otherwise, we'll see you in the morning. You have a good night. And what researchers hope to find from watching veterans like Paul sleep could someday help the lives of thousands of others who've been to war. These are the T-walls that protect us from the bombs that fall every now and then around here. Paul Dordell's tour of duty in Iraq is not the first time he has served his country. In the mid-1980s, he was stationed in West Germany for three years. After leaving the Army, Paul went to seminary school and eventually settled into a career as a pastor in Pittsburgh. Then, in 2008, at the age of 43, this husband and father of three re-enlisted, feeling there was a need for chaplains during the Iraq War. That was very difficult. Uh, there were many uh, nights of crying and uh, difficulties uh, in our own family as uh, I got the orders to go to Iraq. His tour lasted 11 months, and as a chaplain, he went where the soldiers went, on duty for spiritual support, on duty in times of trouble. When we did go out on missions, of course, everyone is locked and loaded. Uh, we are hyper-vigilant as we're rolling through the streets. Uh, no one knows who the next terrorist might be or what that piece of garbage on the side of the street might be. Uh, there was always gunfire, a constant din of gunfire. You are... 24-7, uh, hyper-aware of your surroundings, and then you come home. That day when we came back was amazing, uh, to see my family and to just grab each other, hold each other. Uh, the tears that we shed uh, were just tears of joy. As Paul returned to civilian life, his days were fairly routine, his nights were anything but. All sorts of noises would disturb me. I wouldn't know what they were. Any bang uh, would be the sound of potentially of a rocket attack. Uh, I was probably sleeping four hours a night, uh, waking up five, six times a night uh, when I first got back, and mostly being woken up from dreams. And, uh, there was mass confusion. And, uh, because of the disconnect of being back home, my family was often in the dreams. Uh, so it was really kind of scary uh, to be under attack in war but my family right there. Uh, and my primary fear was for their lives and protecting them. At his reserve unit back in Pittsburgh, Paul heard about a sleep study for veterans. He signed up immediately. So we're looking for good sleepers and bad sleepers, if you want. Dr. Ann Germain is an associate professor of psychiatry and psychology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Her research is happening in a sleep lab with seven bedrooms where participants spend the night. Clinicians monitor sleep patterns, brain activity, breathing patterns, eye and body movement. Okay, Paul, could you roll on to your left side for me, please? Paul Dordell is one of about 230 participants, all veterans who served in Afghanistan or Iraq, some with sleep trouble, some without. Even if you have been exposed to combat and you don't have sleep disturbances, we want to understand what is it about you that makes your sleep so resilient to that amount of stress. One of Dr. Germain's studies looks at how to treat insomnia in veterans. The other monitors the brain activity of veterans as they sleep. We're trying to understand what is it about the brain of people with sleep disturbances and with post-traumatic stress disorder that is different from people who have also been exposed to combat but don't have sleep problems or don't have PTSD. She follows veterans who have PTSD and who don't, and she's watching how the brain changes from when vets are awake compared to when they're in dream sleep, also known as rapid eye movement or REM sleep. We suspect that in people with post-traumatic stress disorder who have nightmares, their brain during REM sleep is probably more activated than it should, especially in the centers of the brain that are involved in fear regulation and the fear response so that we could develop treatments or refine the treatments that we have already to try to compensate for these um, disturbances. 
The Pittsburgh sleep studies are just two of dozens of PTSD research projects or treatments going on across the country, where doctors are looking into such issues as why women are twice as likely as men to develop PTSD. Veterans are also being put into virtual reality combat situations to see if prolonged exposure therapy helps to dissipate anxiety and fear. There's a program helping veterans process traumatic memories through eye movement therapy. And coming to Pittsburgh in 2013, a new state-of-the-art veterans research facility. Getting in to sleep there. As for Dr. Germain's sleep studies, she's also finding another positive result. Veterans who sleep better are better equipped to handle emotional issues they've been reluctant to address before. I'm sleeping seven, eight hours every night, not having the dreams anymore. It's for lunch. Turkey sandwiches. Paul Dordell was not diagnosed with PTSD. He'd taken early steps before his combat stress might have developed into something more serious. If the reality is that we all come back with some sort of post-traumatic stress, uh, and it really behooves us to get the help so that we can keep it from becoming the disorder. My poppy is away right now. He's in Iraq. At his home in suburban Pittsburgh, Paul's son Micah Dordell created this illustrated booklet when his dad was overseas. It's uh, called Dealing with the Monsters. And, uh, my son was uh, dealing with the monsters of uh, deployment. Let me tell you a story about four monsters that visited me while he was gone. The mad monster got mad when his poppy had to go away. Micah's story is just one example of how a soldier's stress and deployment is shared by the entire family. We won't have to deal with the monsters anymore because poppy will be home. We were together again. Mm -hmm. How many Marines does it take to uh, let you uh, I did two, two, two army guy to hold your honor. <laughs> On a cool March night, these veterans gather around a bonfire that sparks the beginning of a weekend retreat. Who wants a marshmallow? Their leader, Iraq War veteran Tony Canzanieri, who's made great progress since beginning treatment for his PTSD. It took me a really long time to finally just realize that I couldn't handle this, what was going on by myself. I needed someone else to help me. I needed, you know, I needed to talk to somebody that knew what I was going through. Tony is not only organizing events like this, he's now doing much more to help veterans in the Pittsburgh area. And how he got here is the story of a soldier who went from darkness to light. Oh, no. Uh, two years ago, I definitely did not imagine myself doing something like this. More than two years into therapy, Tony is now a student at California University of Pennsylvania working on an MBA. Do we have like 214 and stuff for them? He's also a graduate assistant in the Office of Veterans Affairs, helping other students with everything from VA education benefits to veterans events. He is the guy that makes things happen. Robert Pra is a 10-year veteran of the National Guard and Tony's boss at Cal U. He's been a huge asset to the campus. He is a person that is very approachable, very knowledgeable. For some veterans, it is very difficult to navigate the VA system as a whole. He has helped with all the aspects involved with uh, navigating the system. It's also here on campus where Tony has office space for Vets for Vets, the organization he says changed his life. The method that worked for me the best was Vets for Vets, meeting other Iraq and Afghanistan vets on a level playing field as peers. Vets for Vets is a national nonprofit that helps Afghanistan and Iraq era war veterans heal from the psychological injuries of war. Tony went to his first session in 2008. I was shocked at how everybody was me. It was just a, a powerful experience for me to realize that I wasn't the only person going through this and I, I wasn't, you know, crazy. And then we'll be able to um, get them registered. The more active he became with Vets for Vets, uh, the more pronounced his recovery. Tony's dedication helped grow the Western Pennsylvania chapter. In 2009, he was named director, making trips to Washington, attending seminars and other events to improve the lives of veterans. He's a go-getter. He deeply cares about the veterans and their issues and making sure that they're taken care of. 
Throughout the year, Vets for Vets sponsors weekend retreats with outdoor activities like this, which are meant to be more than just fun. It's really an integral part of the recovery process is building these relationships with other vets and stopping the isolation that a lot of us vets place ourselves into. Um, there are some sign-up sheets over here. Not everyone who attends the retreats has PTSD. Some have suffered minor combat stress. Others are here because they enjoy the military camaraderie or just want to support their fellow vets. I know the best way to put it, it, it translates better in Spanish. Una, una gran persona. Anyway, that means like a grand person. Like, that's like a person with big heart, and that's how I see vets. The retreat lasted three days, hosted 29 veterans. Their expenses covered by Vets for Vets. The setting, Antiochian Village, a conference and retreat center just outside Ligonier, Pennsylvania. It's a really peaceful location, great grounds, and, you know, kind of gets the vets in a, in a safe environment to where it's okay to talk about these type of things. It wasn't necessarily losing people or combat exposure that affected me the most. Michelle that Wilmot the says that when she was in Iraq, racism and psychological abuse she faced from superiors caused her to leave the army and led to her anger issues. I think they expected for me to, to fold, to fall apart, but I fell apart in a different way. I didn't fall apart and give up. I fell apart in a way where I wanted to kill them. She was angry that no one was held accountable, angry that so few people could relate to her frustration. And not only that, I wanted somebody who understood what I was talking about <laughs> and not somebody who'd be like, oh, you poor victim. Oh, and you're a woman and a minority? Oh, you poor thing, because I hate that. It's like, no, it's not being a victim. I survived. I wasn't just victimized. I survived this shit. I just want to tell somebody because I'm holding it. Michelle is now an active veterans advocate in Tucson. She traveled to the Pittsburgh retreat to run the women's support group. <laughs> and she's found that helping others is now helping her too. I don't think we heal necessarily from just addressing our issues. That's a part of it. But, and that's, you know, that's an ongoing process while I'm working with Vets for Vets. I get to vent out a lot of my frustrations. However, I'm helping somebody else, and that helps me relieve some of the bitterness that I still hold. When Sean Pearl headed for the retreat, he almost turned back. I didn't know who I was going to meet or what it was about. And I figured I got the motorcycle, I could always leave. I needed a way out. I always run. Running from himself is what Sean has done in recent years, but it wasn't always like that. He joined the Pennsylvania Army National Guard at the age of 18 and spent more than two decades serving his country. During those years, he earned a degree in electrical engineering and had a steady job. During a tour of duty in Iraq in January 2006, his vehicle was hit by an IED, a roadside bomb. Two months later, it happened again. This time, the damage and trauma was even worse. My body core temperature dropped so low they had me in a body bag with the uh, heat packs. I know I did a body bag with a, a hole cut out for my face with a catheter. And honestly, I thought I was dead. Back home in Pennsylvania, troubles came quickly. The symptoms was crazy. I thought I was going crazy. Memory loss, short-term memory. I found it difficult to even uh, write out a check in my checkbook without getting the shakes, anxiety, and uh, the cold sweats. Things would get worse. Sean lost his job of 23 years because of his drinking. He racked up two DUIs. And after a violent flashback to the bombing, he was involuntarily committed to a psychiatric unit. And it's like I fought for my country, and now I'm coming home and I'm fighting, uh, fighting for my freedom. <laughs> and I fought for everybody else, and now I'm fighting for my own. Let's go. For Sean, come on. The structured military life was gone. Come here. His personal life in turmoil, and his future. I uh, know. Yeah, I'm struggling with that. I'm struggling with myself. I didn't foresee myself being alive more than two more years. You got all the loyalty in the world, huh? You're better than some of my soldiers I had, huh? You listen. To I can't see it past tomorrow. Yes, you do. Because I'm struggling with today. 
I want that serenity. I want that peace of mind. I, I was scared. Everybody's scared when you get there. If you say you're not, you're a liar. At the Vets uh, for Vets retreat, Tony Canzaneri is leading the conversation. Sean decided to stay, but is apprehensive. He's had private therapy, but he has never been in a group session like this. I mean, I sit here and I just think about where, where to even start. He's never shared with peers until now. I've killed people. I've almost been killed by people. I feel we was blessed and we was lucky, but what is luck? Surviving, being alive. The sad thing is you learn how to survive, but you forget how to live. And uh, that's what I've been doing. I've just been surviving. These men talked about their hurts in several meetings, where Tony encourages positive thoughts too. In one discussion, he asked each vet to choose a desired destination and a dream companion. I want to go back to Iraq, not wearing a uniform. I said the same thing. To give me, give me closure for kind of like a Vietnam vet going back to see the, the work that you did, the risk that you took, and, and see what kind of change, positive change. You know what I mean? If there is a positive change. If it makes sense to anybody. It makes perfect sense. Yeah, who would I take with me? I'd take my dog. It's my best friend. <laughs> Come on, girl. Sean continues treatment for PTSD and is undergoing testing up. for TBI, Where they at? traumatic brain injury. Put him up. He's attending AA and has found new spiritual strength at church. That first group session with Vets for Vets was yet another step in his recovery. I had some rough times through it, but sometimes that's what I needed to do was open up and let out a lot of my suppressed feelings. You just need to step up and realize that asking for help isn't a show of weakness. It's actually a show of strength. Sean Pearl would show that strength in a poem he wrote about his first retreat. Survivors of the fight that fell upon another country's sand. We are soldiers of a lost breed that no one else can seem to understand. So we may no longer be just surviving as strangers in our own land, but living as everyday people once again. It's a little bit of inspiration from my weekend, what I felt in my heart and what it provided for me. And, uh, part of sharing, part of sharing with other veterans, because I believe there's a lot of veterans out there that feel the same way I do. There you go, good job. 20 years from now, I want my son to, to look back and see me as, you know, the best possible man that I could have been, and I, uh, I want him to be proud of, of who I was. Talking helps, but I've seen how many of the other fellows there that were helped. Now when I look at myself, I see you know, a compassionate individual, uh, someone that's able to control their anger and control their emotions a little bit better. I knew that he was a decent man. He just needed help. Am I going to say I don't have bad days? No. Will I ever be the same person I was before? No. But I'm really happy with where I'm at right now, and I, I owe that all to, you know, to the people that have helped me along the way. I don't think you can really heal without giving something back. And that's why Tony Canzaneri has joined the ranks of Veterans Helping Veterans. We need to intervene when a soldier is hurting. That's as heroic as going to the battle and uh, fighting alongside them. And I'm not going to leave another vet behind. He's thankful to have come so far and is now there for others who are just beginning the journey. It's been a long road home, definitely a long road home. It was a struggle for me to come forth, and that's the fight that I had to do, do for myself my own happiness and my own life. And uh, hopefully I will find my way home.
Funding for this program was made possible by the Staunton Farm Foundation. Thank you. Welcome back to the panel discussion portion of Healing Minds, Changing Attitudes. I'm your host this evening, Jancy Sheets. We're talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD in adults. And joining us to speak further on this topic, Linda Northern, who is Acting Coordinator for the Office of Consumer Affairs at the Division of Behavioral Health Services, Arkansas Department of Human Services. We also have Dr. Jeffrey Pine, a research scientist and staff physician at Central Arkansas Veterans Healthcare System and professor for the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, College of Medicine at UAMS. Dr. Eric Macias, who is Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Medical Director for the Walker Family Clinic at the Psychiatric Research Institute at UAMS. And last but not least, Dr. Joshua Sisler, who is Assistant Professor for the Psychiatric Research Institute at UAMS. And we do want to thank everyone for joining us tonight and thank you to the viewers. We have our phone lines that are open and we will be taking your calls throughout the hour. Toll free number to call is 1-800-662-2386. You can also email us at paffairs at aetn.org. And we do want to begin tonight with all of those titles you guys are well informed and very knowledgeable when it comes to this subject and we thank you for being here tonight we have lots of questions coming in and we will get to these throughout the hour but we want to start with the basics josh let's start with what is post-traumatic stress disorder yeah so post-traumatic stress disorder is a mental health disorder and it is characterized by a couple different categories of symptoms so the, firstly it's a um, necessary criterion that the individual has been exposed to some type of traumatic event so there's all different um, ways that someone can experience a traumatic event. So broadly speaking, we think of a trauma as something where the individual experiences fear, horror, or helplessness, uh, where the situation involves some type of real or imagined um, physical or psychological or sexual injury. This is not just something emotional that happens after experiencing one of these traumatic events, but something physical goes on inside of your brain. What happens? Yeah, um, that's, that's a really good question. We don't know all of the answers to that, and we're starting mm -hmm. to figure it out. Um, there's a lot of research that's coming out now. Um, something that we know happens in a traumatic event is that uh, the brain releases a very strong stress response. So you can think of a trauma as a very, very extreme type of a stressor. And when there is a stressor, our body responds to it with a, um, a pretty reliable stress response. So there's a neural system that encodes a stress responding and emotional reactivity. And that system is uh, very highly engaged after some type of a trauma. And as we we're talking uh, before uh, we got an air, mm -hmm. it's very important to mention that after a trauma, it is very normal for uh, individuals to have um, a lot of anxiety, for individuals to experience a lot of um, emotional distress or physiological distress when something reminds them of the trauma. That's the normal response. So f for the first month or so after a trauma, almost everyone's going to experience that to some degree. But that's not necessarily That's not necessarily post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder is what's sometimes referred to as um, a problem recovering from trauma. So after about three months, most people will have kind of recovered naturally and their symptoms, that anxiety, that emotional arousal comes back to baseline. But for individuals with PTSD, which is maybe about 10% mm -hmm. of the population, that those symptoms don't go away on their own. And in that case, the symptoms that we're talking about is very um, extreme emotional or physiological reactivity when there's something that reminds them of the trauma. There's some type of avoidance of uh, things that make them think about the trauma. And there's some type of hyperarousal symptoms, so that could be um, what we call hypervigilance hyper for threats. So people looking out for danger, people having a very extreme startle response, problems sleeping, angry outbursts. Traditionally, that's, those are the symptoms that we look for with PTSD. And recently, we added a new category of symptoms that have to refer to um, changes in cognition or beliefs about the world or themselves, such as um, shame or guilt. We are going to talk more about symptoms, too. And Jeff, when we were talking before the program began, you said it's not just fear issues, but there are moral issues a lot of times that PTSD patients suffer from. Right. So. Um, Traditionally, it's been a fear-based illness, and, and those are the symptoms that we uh, seem to key in on. And, and more recently, there's been a recognition that 
there may be moral injury and the guilt and shame-based symptoms that, uh, that cause the majority of problems for some patients with PTSD. So there's been sort of a shift in focus to, to how best to address those symptoms because they don't fit well within our fear-based treatments, if you will. When we focus on treatments coming up in a bit, we're going to talk about the differences in treating different patients. PTSD, it's been in the news recently, but this has been a, around for maybe centuries. Dr. Macias, you were saying yes. that there's evidence in history of PTSD being prevalent. Right. Uh, the, the, the best recent evidence comes all the way from the Civil War. So in the Civil War, there were descriptions of uh, a soldier's heart, which was a condition after the war that people developed something close to anxiety. But if we actually want to look back all the way 2,000 years ago in the descriptions of the Trojan War, uh, you can see some of those characters having symptoms of PTSD after the Trojan War and what they saw there. So this is not a new construct. It's something that we probably have, uh, have coped with for many, many years because we have a very complex brain. And uh, one way to think about what Josh and uh, Jeff just described is if that emotion, that emergency response in the brain cannot be turned off. So if you think about how you felt when you have incredible fear, and if you think about living that from time to time unpredictably, it can be a very dysfunctional and painful existence. So we need to, you know, that's one way to conceptualize, is that you cannot turn off some areas of the brain that have been turned on by trauma. The documentary that we just saw focused on veterans, but in reality, PTSD is widespread in the civilian population. Who are the majority of your patients that are coming in for treatment? What, what are the scenarios involved with them? Well, unfortunately, one thing we need to say is that the majority of patients with PTSD are actually not male, or the females, mm -hmm. and the type of trauma they are most exposed to are sexual trauma. So one of the things I wanted to, to, to make sure people take home today is this message that PTSD is not restricted to, to guys, but actually girls seem to be both uh, more, um, present more with those symptoms, suffer more, and there is an incredible uh, amount of trauma going on in our society that we need to make sure we try to address. Josh, you said even children now, you can pinpoint children who may be suffering. Sure, um, the sim there's a lot of symptom overlap in how we diagnose PTSD in children and in adults. Um, there might be a little bit differences in children when you account for um, language. So a child might not necessarily know how to describe if they're having a flashback. They might not know how to describe or have the words or the language. Um, for their re-experiencing or hypervigilant symptoms, um, but they're experiencing the same thing. So that, that's one of the problems with the presentation with um, PTSD presentation with children is that they can't describe the symptoms in the same way that adults can. But we do know that children are also experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. Something interesting when I was researching this is cancer survivors. You wouldn't normally think of cancer survivors or maybe uh, people that have suffered sexual assault and you normally think of people coming back from war in very violent situations, but it's just anything traumatic that's happened in your life. Correct. Is that correct with that? Yep. Yeah, not necessarily to you, mm -hmm. but to right. somebody you love or you care for. Right. So sometimes we see people develop PTSD symptoms when the trauma happened to somebody that either they witness or they care or they love. So it's important to remember that too. Trauma doesn't have to be to the person suffering PTSD. Well, viewers are calling in, and once again, that number is on the screen. It's 1-800-662-2386. Want to get to one of those questions now. We briefly talked about this, but this is a viewer from Danville who asked, what are the symptoms of PTSD? Do people with PTSD normally lock themselves up for months or years? Who wants to address this? Well, um, Josh, I'll, you I'll start with the, <laughs> the symptoms. Um, uh, I, I think of the hallmark symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder as uh, intense physiological or emotional reactivity to anything that reminds the individual of the trauma. Um, there's a lot of symptoms that go along in addition to that, but I tend to think of that as kind of the hallmark feature. Um, in addition to that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the individuals often try to avoid situations that make them think of the trauma, and in those cases, um, you sometimes see individuals who uh, don't like to leave their house. Um, I don't know of any cases um, where this has actually happened, but I could imagine it being possible that someone with PTSD 
would not leave their house for months or years at a time. Um, we typically think of that as something more like agoraphobia. Um, but I think that's that's possible. That could be consistent with uh, a PTSD presentation. Well, and, and we we see that with veterans certainly. I mean, there's there's a there is a group that will basically you know retreat to the hills, if you will, mm -hmm. and um, and they may they may access the VA, but very infrequently. And basically, they want to be left alone. And part of that is probably driven by the difficulties they have in interpersonal. Um, relationships because of the symptoms that they have, the anger, you know, the, uh, the distrust, um, and the avoidance. Um, and if, you know, if they're having flashbacks related to their traumatic, I mean, that, those, that, it's not easy to be around yeah. those people. Right. Yeah, and those people, it's hard for those people to be around right. anyone else. So they find that it's easier right. just to retreat, sure. Jeff, is, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Dr. there is a particular... Uh, feeling that some of my patients describe to me, which is this idea that they think that nobody else can relate to what they have been through. Mm -hmm. So they feel very alone. So when I think about the avoidance, they just think, nobody can understand what I've been through. And even, even with we all knowing and discussing, for example, the, the, the question of the epidemic of uh, rape on campus mm -hmm. uh, today, women that suffer rape have this incredible sense of shame, go back to the shame, yeah. and sense that Nobody else has been through this. Nobody, I, nobody can relate to what I've been through. And one of the things we do at our clinic is, is we offer them group therapy. And one of the first things they, they report when they go through group therapy is they say, I didn't know there were so many people that share the same fear, share the same shame, the same anxiety. So this idea that, that you are alone in the, in, the, in the world is a very important think we need to break yeah which is and there are the people suffering from that speaking of that you mentioned how prevalent sexual violence is mm -hmm. um, you know one in five women has experienced some type of sexual assault yeah it's a really high number and there's so much stigma against sexual assault that no one really talks yes. about it which contributes to this feeling that the individuals alone and no one else can relate Linda are there support groups throughout Arkansas and how do you find one of these groups if you want to go and talk to people who have gone through the same thing you have so um, yes uh, as far as the, um, the Division of Behavioral Health mm -hmm. who I work for um, uh, we don't provide this service but certainly we uh, I can give you the phone number and we any individual across the state can call in and we will then um, uh, guide them to what services are available in their area um, because we have providers throughout the the state of Arkansas Jeff PTSD can it lie dormant for years or is this how long after a traumatic event will signs start showing up yeah, they, they usually start showing up within the first few months mm -hmm. and then I think we've mentioned that normally the, the symptoms will decay you know there's sort of a, a natural sort of decay to the symptoms and the, and the person will be functioning just fine but um, these symptoms can uh, basically not be present for years and even decades and we're, we're seeing um, Vietnam veterans now we were talking about that earlier mm -hmm. as well who, um, you know, decades after their uh, combat exposure are now uh, showing up with symptoms of PTSD. And so um, we think that, I mean, there's probably a variety of different reasons for that, but one is that their cognitive reserve that was keeping those symptoms at bay um, is now starting to decline. And so then these symptoms start to emerge. And which can really take the patient and the family off guard. Mm -hmm. Especially something since they don't expect. you've been fine for years and years. Right. This caller kind of has a question related to this. This caller comes from Altus. Are the symptoms of PTSD better controlled if treatment is started earlier after symptoms begin? Is there training available for military trainees to deal with this before it occurs? And is there an easy way to identify PTSD early after trauma occurs? Maybe before the symptoms or signs start becoming apparent? <laughs> You want to take it right. question by question? Let's yeah, start with a the, lot there. Are the symptoms of PTSD better controlled if treatment is started earlier? Well, I, I think I think that's that's the case with just about any mental mm -hmm. illness. Yeah. I mean, if we can kind of get on on top of it early, then the outcomes are going to be much better. Um, and the, the same is true of PTSD. How about is there training available for military trainees to deal with this before it occurs? So maybe 
are military personnel briefed on this? Are they aware of this before they go into combat? They, they absolutely are, and um, and it's even gone so far as there's now master resilience trainers that are part of um, large uh, military units that are specifically tasked to uh, deliver resilience training uh, prior to deployment, and so that has a lot to do with you know um, how to cope with stress. Um, and, and, a, and a variety of, and how to recognize it, mm -hmm. both in you and your battle buddy, if you will. And so um, I think, you know, the military is definitely recognizing that, you know, an ounce of prevention yeah. is worth a pound of cure, so they're trying to get it early. And given the prevalence of trauma we see, even in the civilian population, I wonder if we should have some of these programs mm -hmm. in college campus around this, the country, because of the level of the prevalence sure. of trauma we see. So how about how even see that? in our emergency rooms across the state, are there any psychological services for gunshot victims, sexual assault victims that are coming in? Is anything d being done right then to prevent maybe from PTSD becoming apparent? There are um, social workers mm -hmm. who are stationed in emergency rooms right. and would consult in those types of cases just to see if there's a need and or an interest um, for therapy or for some type of psychiatric services making recommendations for that um, and s speaking of that there's been some recent um, research has come out some clinical trials that have come out that have taken uh, gunshot victims or assault victims or rape victims who present to the emergency room and immediately give them um, some type of psychological treatment very intense psychological treatment the last maybe one to three weeks um, and has found that that uh, reduces the incidence of PTSD developing by half. So uh, typically, in, after about three months when someone presents to the ER with, say, a gunshot or after a recent rape, um, about 50% will still have PTSD after three months. Um, and that was cut in half by this very intense uh, acute psychological treatment. So it's promising to suggest that if we intervene very early, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. catch things very early, that we can reduce the impact. Is anything do being done in Arkansas, I don't know if you know this, to track these patients who leave the ER, go back into civilian life, and any way to see long term? Yeah, that's, that's a really okay. uh, important thing for us to be doing. I don't think we're doing it in any systematic way at the moment, but I know that some of us who are interested in re researching PTSD are looking into that and we're starting to get programs um, going that will do just that thing because that's very important. If you're not suffering yourself but you have a loved one who may be suffering, what are some of the, Dr. Messia, signs and symptoms that you should look for in, a, in someone you care about who may be going through something difficult like this? Yes. So the, one key symptoms is this idea of hyper arousal, mm -hmm. right? Somebody who's, so one example is the soldier come back and, you know, has startle response hearing gunshot wounds, mm -hmm. right? So that type of response, a very strong emotional response to things that are usually would not create that type of response is an, is an easy sign to, to remember. Uh, the other is avoidance, right? You gave the example of people going to the woods, which is an extreme case, right. but avoidance can take uh, a lot of different, you know, forms, even, you know, trying to, um, to avoid anything that can remember the trauma, that can remind them of the trauma. So, so you got to look at avoidance. These are important things. Irritability is one situation. Some of the cognitive changes and mood yeah. changes that you can see. People become more irritable than, than they mm -hmm. used to. And, um, you know, th these are some of the signs. And for, um, so for the, 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 the um, one way to look at the, the avoidance and, and over uh, arousal in military is usually the weapons they carry around. And always having a weapon available and it's something that the, 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 the veterans are very keen on having some level of protection as if their house is going to be invaded tonight. But for the women, um, their friends can usually see that the girl was withdrawn, doesn't want to share things anymore, doesn't want to talk, doesn't want to interact as much before because of that sense of shame that you see in victims of uh, sexual violence. At what point should you see a doctor and who do you turn to? What is your first person that you need to contact to get help? Jeff, you want to answer that? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I think, I mean, a anybody on the medical side of the house, so I mean, it could be your primary care mm -hmm. doctor, um, it, you know, it could be a mental health provider, but I think um, just, uh, 
If you have a suspicion, um, get an assessment. If you have a loved one who you're concerned about, encourage them just to get an assessment. Usually that's going to re require um, a mental health uh, provider mm -hmm. to do that assessment, but um, just sort of move them in that direction. Uh, the treatments, I know we're holding off on treatments, but there are effective treatments. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, and it is something, as we've mentioned, it's, it's not, you know, that they're not alone in this. I mean, it, it's unfortunately, it's, it's one of the illnesses that we see too much of. It's among the top five most prevalent mental disorders. Yeah. Okay. And the other thing I would say for teens, if they trust their pediatrician, mm -hmm. which I hope they will, they should actually go to their pediatrician. Yeah. That's their PCP, right. somebody that knows them, caring for them. Because one, one tragedy of PTSD is that because of the shame associated with it, you don't want to tell your family mm -hmm. sometimes. Okay. The people close to you, which will actually should be supportive to you, you don't want to tell them. So I think the, 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 the health care providers should be that middle ground, right? Where people can feel safe, that they can get care, they're not going to be judged, and that we can kind of get things going for them. And speaking of social support, something that we know from the research is that social support provides a buffer mm -hmm. against developing PTSD. So someone who's been through a trauma and they have a really close group of friends who really reaches out to them or they're close with their family, they're going to be less likely to develop PTSD. And that's another message that's important for us to communicate in a forum like this, that social support is very important. So if you know someone who's recently been through a trauma and they're withdrawing, that's a symptom. Mm -hmm. You know, you might need to reach out to them. They might need three calls instead of one, but it's important to do that. Well, let's move on to screening and diagnosing someone with PTSD. Okay. How do you screen people? How do you know if they are suffering from this or if they are just in a little bit of shock and will recover in a couple of months? Sure, so we have different um, screening instruments um, that are very simple, easily administered. You can screen for PTSD. You know, in a, in a normal clinical interview, you can screen for PTSD, just the specific symptoms in less than 10 minutes. So it doesn't take very long to screen for PTSD at all. So how do you know if someone has it? How do you diagnose someone? Uh, it's, ba it's based on the presence of symptoms. Um, so we, you know, based on our, our diagnostic manual, there are a certain number of symptoms that have to be there. Yeah. in order to meet criteria for PTSD, yeah. and that's what we'd be looking for. We always wish there was a blood test that yeah. we could mm -hmm. do, but there is no blood test. There is actually no brain imaging that, that, that can be done. We hope that one day we'll get there, that we'll find the brain signatures, that we're going to find the cortisol levels, right, that we can find the, 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 those patients. But for now, PTSD is still a clinical diagnosis, which means is that diagnosis you're going to get if you're honest with your physician or mental health provider, and if you tell them what's actually going on in your mind. And we mentioned earlier that it, a lot of people are hesitant on doing this. In fact, the documentary stated that people are concerned about side effects of medicine when we get into the treatment. Mm -hmm. Getting treatment would hurt their career or family and friends can help them cope and they do not need someone to help them, a doctor to help them along. Right. So there are a lot of people that are scared to get help but that do need help. Taking another question from viewers. This one is from Little Rock. Are there any clinical trials going on in central Arkansas that are not specific to veterans? Dr. Macias, if you want to answer that. Yes, we do have some uh, research projects going on right now that can be recruiting uh, patients. Uh, that can be assessed through the UMS Psychiatric Research Institute website. Um, we don't have a specific clinical trial right now for treatment, but we have research protocols going on right now for the brain uh, signatures that we talked about. We have research to identify people using different methods. So there are, we do have ongoing research studies that uh, we would like to, to make sure people know about. Linda, we talked about support groups, but is there anything going on statewide to be proactive and just to get the word out about PT PTSD and share the information? Um, so, on behalf of the division again, mm -hmm. um, PTSD is not something that we just single out because we um, address mental illness and addictions uh, as a whole. Uh, and so, um, so the, the data that is collected mm -hmm. is data then that um, uh, doesn't, doesn't single out PTSD. The data that we have uh, is uh, how many persons with mental illness and addictions are being served. And PTSD, as the doctors mm -hmm. have said, is just a form of that mental illness. 
illness. This question deals with various mental illnesses. From Fayetteville, what are the similarities and differences between PTSD, borderline personality disorder, and bipolar disorder in a person who has experienced death of a child and multiple rapes? Who wants to tackle that one? That's, Josh? You that, that's, a, that's a really, really good question. Mm -hmm. um, so at, at a broad level, that question uh, reflects how much symptom overlap there is between our different mental health disorders. So um, as Dr. Macias was saying earlier, you know, these mental illnesses have existed for a long time. Our understanding of them evolves over time. So one way that I like to describe this to people is to kind of think about the diagnoses that we have are labels. Um, it's kind of like if you uh, think of the Big Dipper, the Big Dipper is a label that we put on a constellation of stars, right? So our label of PTSD is just a word that right now we're putting on a constellation of observable symptoms. And what we agree upon with those observable symptoms might change over time. So in regards to that specific question, you know, it's really hard to differentiate something like borderline personality disorder from PTSD in someone who is the victim of, in this example, it's what childhood sexual uh, abuse child a loss, loss of a child, child and multiple rapes sexual and multiple assault rapes mm -hmm. and i think the other differentiating diagnosis there was bipolar disorder borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder yeah from ptsd, from PTSD. Uh, yeah but, but so so just remember that in this question you have several traumas right so we have somebody with multiple traumas if uh, uh, the more traumas you have the more likely you are to develop ptsd and the worse the trauma Okay, so you have that. The fact that you have those disorders, even if you had them before, will not make you immune to PTSD. Mm -hmm. Actually, you can have both. If anything, the, having those diagnoses will probably make you at higher risk of developing PTSD after the trauma. It will also make you at higher risk to having trauma because of the risky behaviors associated with those disorders. So are some people predispos predisposed to? Yes. As we discussed yeah. before, okay. uh, lots of people, uh, 50 to 60 percent of the population experience trauma, 15 percent of the population will have PTSD, right? Yeah, as, as a really good example, right. you know, the, uh, one of the genes that's very popular right now is the serotonin transporter gene, and we know that if someone has a certain allele or version of the serotonin transporter gene, that they're more likely to develop PTSD following trauma. So there are genetic risk factors that might makes someone more uh, at risk versus resilient. This question is very similar to the other. Dr. Pine, I'm going to direct this to you. Is there a difference in the severity of symptoms seen between PTSD from, say, child abuse, sexual assault, than from war? Are the signs and symptoms different, or will they experience a lot of the same things? No, there, there, there will be um, a big overlap there. I mean, the, um, I mean, the, tra the trauma that, you know, people experience I mean, I mean I think as we were talking um, it can kick off this sort of fear-based um, response and that that can be associated with sexual assault you know combat exposure um, and unfortunately sexual assault you know even happens within combat zones so I mean it's I in terms of the symptoms I, I would think that there's really there's no sort of cluster of symptoms that's specific to a, a given trauma. Would, yes. you, would you agree? Some people would argue that if um, there's some type of childhood trauma, mm -hmm. that the presentation can get more complex. So there's, there's some good research, mm -hmm. um, or there's, I should say, there's some reliable research that as the amount of trauma exposure increases, so if someone's been raped multiple times or been raped and been in a car accident, and been the victim of domestic violence that the symptom complexity increases. So those are the individuals who meet criteria for PTSD and a substance use disorder and maybe bipolar disorder. So there's aspects like that, that the um, amount of trauma and the timing of trauma might make a little bit of difference as well. But that, like, like you were saying, that's more in terms of maybe comorbid diagnoses and not necessarily the PTSD symptoms. Let's move on to treatment. Dr. Pine, once you're diagnosed, let's focus on veterans. What treatment is available in Arkansas for veterans? 
Uh, there's a, a variety of different treatments. Uh, the, the VA you know, focuses on evidence-based treatments, so there's evidence-based psychotherapies that are available. Um, and they're available, you know, in person or over televideo if they're, if they're being seen at one of the community-based clinics. Um, there's residential treatment that's available, um, you know, actually at the, at the uh, North Little Rock facility. Um, and then there's medication treatments and there's um, the, um, the FDA-approved medications, uh, it's a relatively short list. Of, um, of antidepressant medications, mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's a variety of other, as we've, as we've talked about, the comorbidity that's associated with PTSD is very high, comorbid depression, comorbid substance abuse, traumatic brain injury, but uh, so, there's a, so there's a variety of other uh, medications that can be used that are more symptom specific. And you guys are looking into treating patients that are having moral issues and not the fear issues. And you said this is kind of difficult. This is not a one size fits all. And you guys are looking into this and researching how best to treat these patients. Right. Uh, so the moral injury um, is sort of the term that um, the National Center for PTSD at the VA has has adopted. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the VA is recognizing that moral injury is a factor um, in addition to the fear-based symptoms and um, and there are a couple of interventions that are now uh, underway to uh, to specifically address the moral injury um, symptoms and the, the VA estimates that among veterans with PTSD about a third um, have moral injury as the main problem that they're dealing with and um, and the problem for veterans is that uh, as mental health providers, um, you know, th this is a symptom cluster that we really haven't been able to have a large impact with our evidence-based treatments or our medications. You said a lot of those will actually make people feel guiltier. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're in an exposure therapy, which is, which is effective for the fear-based symptoms, and then you put an individual with you know, moral injury as their primary problem, then yes, it could be, you could compound uh, those symptoms. And, and one of the things that um, we've been interviewing, um, you know, veterans about this issue, and, you know, one of the themes that comes back is, you know, that they recognize that what they need is uh, forgiveness for either uh, things that they've done, things that they've witnessed, um, things that they haven't done, mm -hmm. um, but they don't know where to turn for that. I mean, the obvious place is the clergy, but they don't feel like they can, they can go there. Um, they don't feel worthy to talk to, uh, you know, someone in the clergy, and they don't, and then, you know, it's, it's it, a mental health provider is not the first person that they think of to talk about forgiveness so uh, so it, so it is it's a it's a gap um, that you know thankfully is is being recognized and you know and, and they're looking into you know how best to address that dr. Pine this question from a viewer what is the best treatment for recurring nightmares resistant to medication how long before one should see how long before one should see results with therapy and medication so once you begin treatment when should you start seeing results for me, from nightmares specifically? From nightmares specifically yeah. is what the viewer is asking. Yes. Uh, uh, actually, the VA is, is, is the system that has the best uh, type of experience and care I, for, for I can for I this. can talk about that but one. There if is you want. one particular <laughs> medication that can be used for nightmares that has been very effective. It's actually a medication that was first used for hi hypertension mm -hmm. because it blocks uh, a, a type of uh, arousal response on the sympathetic nerve system. It, it's interesting because I also wanted to complement the answer on the on the medication part mm -hmm. because the medications that are approved for PTSD are two antidepressants, right? And, and some people will say, I'm not depressed. Right. Why should I take an antidepressant? Right. The, the thing is, antidepressant is a terrible name for these medications. Uh, they are serotonin enhancers, right? They enhance some areas of the, the brain that actually control emotions. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. The fact that they help depression and they also help PTSD, they also help anxiety, mm -hmm. 
by us giving them the name antidepressant, we do a terrible service to our patients because uh, they say, I'm not depressed. Mm -hmm. So these medications help PTSD. They are effective. There are some that can help with the nightmares specifically. They help you sleep better. They prevent that emotional response that your body has. Uh, and that will make even wake you up. And, uh, and I, would, I would hope that the patient will start noticing some improvement. We usually give a time frame of four to eight weeks mm -hmm. on an average six weeks. So that's what we kind of think about in terms of the time frame for these medications to work. Okay. Dr. Pine, we've touched on this mm -hmm. a lot. What are we doing now for veterans and those now serving to assist in caring for them? What is the VA doing? So briefly, kind of go over some of the things we've talked about. Uh, well, um, well, I guess you know there, there's there's VA and DoD, and we're and we're trying to sort of bring those you know those two uh, together. So um, the Department of Defense, the military is uh, is working on the prevention uh, part for PTSD, and we can talk some about that. Um, the uh, the VA, in terms of um, I guess in terms of treatment, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, there's um, I mean, there's a variety of different, uh, as I mentioned, a variety of different treatments that are available, and, and they can be they can be obtained, you know, in person. They can be obtained, um, you know, over the televideo. We did a study uh, and just finished it up not too long ago that looked at using um, telephone-based care managers um, for uh, patients with veterans with PTSD, and. Um, and actually had a, uh, a component of that where they received uh, cognitive processing therapy, one of the evidence-based treatments. And what we found was um, that that combination of the care management and the uh, cognitive processing therapy uh, was clearly more effective than, you know, sort of the usual care. And, the, and usual care within the VA is, is a pretty high bar. I mean, they've really focused on that, um, you know, over the past you know, decade that we've been in these most recent wars. So, um, so that that was that was very encouraging, and um, and I think um, the you know the results uh, from that study I believe were just recently published, um, and so you know we'll see going forward if you know if we can kind of implement that on a wider scale. Do you think treatment for veterans is adequate and readily available to everyone in Arkansas? Or like most things or rural areas, is it not adequate in these areas? Do they need more help there? Well, I would say um, if, if all the veterans with PTSD like sought help at the VA tomorrow, mm -hmm. we would be swamped. Mm -hmm. we, we, would not, we would not have the resources uh, you know, to you know, to care for that number of patients. Um, I'm not saying don't seek treatment, <laughs> certainly, um, but just I'm not just, all at eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> right, but um, so you know, the, in Arkansas, I think um, you know the VA over the past um, I don't know five or six years has actually hired a lot of uh, new, uh, opened up a lot of new mental health. Um, Provider positions, and um, and you know they uh, they're trying to fill those. They still have you know they still have openings because uh, they can't even fill all the positions that they have. But um, but you know I, I would say they're doing as best they can with the resources available. Josh, I'll direct this to you. How can you differentiate between memories and reflections? and actual PTSD symptoms. They said symptoms of nervousness, anxiousness in groups, flashbacks, that they all started within the last five years. So are these just reflections or is this person actually suffering from PTSD? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so the simplest answer would be that if those recollections are causing some type of impairment, mm -hmm. so if it's hard for them to have relationships because of the remembering the trauma, if it's hard for them to work, or if they're a student, if it's hard to concentrate on their studies, that would be more consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder. So the symptoms of PTSD uh, can fluctuate. They can be really, really severe, they can be kind of mild, and if someone's been exposed to some type of trauma, there's some degree of PTSD symptoms that might be there. But whether or not we would give it a label of a PTSD diagnosis, 
might depend on whether or not there's some type of impairment associated with it. But it would still be a good idea to get checked out yeah, if just find out what you're dealing with. Exactly. If there's any question about it, mm -hmm. I would definitely recommend getting some type of evaluation. The idea of dysfunctional. Dysfunction is a good tip. It's a good way to look at it. The other thing I usually ask my patients is a sense of control. If you think you can control these flashbacks, even if they come in, can you turn them off? Uh, so when you start losing control of memories and flashbacks is, is when you definitely should look for uh, some sort of treatment or care or evaluation. So control, can you control those memories? Go back, going back to medications and treatment, this one for you, Dr. Macias. Are there medications for PTSD? We did discuss some of these medications, mm -hmm. such as they put hydrocodone, pain meds. What is usually prescribed, though, for PTSD? Not hydrocodone okay. and not <laughs> I did pain not meds. Think so. <laughs> it's this type of uh, okay. is, uh, psychological pain is not helped by opioids. Mm -hmm. And actually, opioids are very dangerous medications, and right now we have a crisis of overusing them. So we need to be very clear about that. As I said, the medications for uh, PTSD are usually related to medications that change your brain chemistry, such as those medications like sertraline or paroxetine, which are called antidepressants, but I would prefer to call them serotonin enhancers. They can enhance your control for your emotions. So it's about control. But medication is not always the answer. No. You just may need treatment, and medicine may not be the answer. Right. In psychotherapy, there are some psychotherapy that are approved and are very effective. Mm -hmm. And Josh is one of our experts on, on these types of uh, effective psychotherapists. Dr. Pine, this one is directed to you. What is the percent of Vietnam veterans that have not gotten treatment of PTSD? But I guess that they would have to be identified as PTSD patients, though, to not get treatment. Right. Like, yeah, are there people that are diagnosed with PTSD that do not get treatment, I guess, would be a better way? Uh, well, there, there are those people. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it would be really hard to put a number on that since, um, since they're not coming in for treatment. Mm -hmm. um, but I think... Uh, I guess, are we seeing more Vietnam veterans stepping forward and getting treatment now that PTSD is a household name? Yes, we are, and I think uh, part of it too is is the uh, you know the aging of the veterans, you know, as they're getting to a point where uh, the PTSD symptoms you know start to uh, emerge where they where they weren't necessarily present earlier. So um, so I think you know I, so yes, I mean we we are seeing more of them you know come forward now. I mean, the PTSD diagnosis itself, I mean, it's only been around since 1980 mm -hmm. as an official diagnosis. So, you know, the Vietnam War was, mm -hmm. you know, 15, 20 years before that. So, um... The other question they're asking is what percent of Vietnam veterans have PTSD compared to veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, um, there's, there's been some more recent studies that have uh, that have looked at the Vietnam veterans, and and they're they're estimating uh, at a rate of about 15 percent. Some some estimates earlier were higher, but um, and then the um, the more recent veterans coming back, you know those those estimates are between 10 and 15 percent for PTSD specifically. If you lump in depression and traumatic brain injury, then certainly, you know, that, that will go up. But for PTSD specifically in the newer veterans, it's probably between 10 and 15 percent. This one, how come everyone drinks after coming back from Vietnam? That's <laughs> assuming a lot. But um, do a lot of people just not seek treatment? But take matters into their own hands and do we see a lot of people turn to alcohol who have PTSD oh absolutely um, yeah. Yeah. I think around half of the people with PTSD have some type of substance use disorder so it's fairly common for someone with PTSD to use something like alcohol or some other type of drug as well such as methamphetamine or cocaine if left untreated what could happen in most cases if um, PTSD is not treated uh, typically it doesn't go away in its own. So we, uh, I think we all mentioned earlier that, you know, the normal response after trauma is this elevated anxiety or PTSD symptoms, and in most cases it goes away in its own. If it doesn't go away in its own after around three months, it's probably not going to, in which case it's going to be really important that there's some type of intervention. 
Does the Division of Behavioral Health work or provide services after traumatic events like the tornadoes that we had this past spring? Linda? Um, and, and actually what we do is we got phone calls and then we um, referred uh, those individuals back to the providers in their areas. Uh, so like the tornadoes it, that occurred in April uh, would have been sent back to around Faulkner County and those, those areas where um, the providers are located. Um, and uh, so, so Division doesn't provide the services. Division of Behavioral Health then, um, ha we have certainly lists of the providers in every area of Arkansas and we refer those individuals back to those providers. And you don't actually have to go, I don't know who wants to answer, answer this, but go through the event yourself, but you can just witness the aftermath of say a tornado. I know as a journalist, we see things all the time and a lot of people have been diagnosed with PTSD in, in the journalism world. And it just goes back to show that you don't have to actually experience the event yourself, right, Josh? That's correct. Yep. You can witness it. You can learn that it's happened to mm -hmm. someone else or a loved one. You don't have to experience it yourself. Same goes for police officers. Mm -hmm. right? First responders. First time. responders. First responders, mm -hmm. yes. So. You get that. This is directed to anyone. I've heard it called post traumatic stress disorder and post traumatic syndrome. What is the difference? Is it really a mental illness? This, the two have me confused. The names have me confused. The official is there name a difference is, the, between? The, the official name is post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. And it is a mental disorder. It's recognized as a medical condition. So it's important to, it's codified as a medical condition. And we were talking earlier, a lot of times it's hard to differentiate between bipolar disorder, depression, PTSD, that there's a fine line between all of these disorders. Not only that, a lot of these patients have more than one condition. Mm -hmm. So it's important to remember that a, a significant number of patients have at least two more conditions. So you, ha you have the usual substance abuse, comorbidity, as well as all the mood disorders. Yeah, there's a lot of symptom overlap across right. disorders. If you look at the symptoms for depression, and the symptoms for PTSD, there's a lot of overlap there. So if you meet criteria for one, you're likely to meet criteria for another one. Once you're treated, are you ever cured? Or do you live with PTSD for the rest of your life? It's, it's, it's a really good question. Um, and that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about this constellation of symptoms, right? So when we talk about PTSD, it's not a thing in the sense that like cancer is a thing. So it's hard to say that it's cured in the sense that it's gone away. Um, so I don't know if I would ever use the cure word, but I would definitely say that uh, if someone is successfully treated and those PTSD symptoms get down to the point where the individual can live a normal life without impairment, that that does not necessarily ever have to come back. It might, mm -hmm. it's possible, but in a lot of cases also it doesn't. So the key is management, right? I think management, manage, you'll be able to manage the symptoms and you're gonna be able to have a good life. I think that's what we should, we, should be able, we should make sure people understand. We're not going to promise that you're going to be cured because that's, that's a word that we don't use in mental health usually. But we promise that you can manage these symptoms, have a good life, enjoy you know, seeing your children grow and enjoy enjoying whatever life you decide to live. So I think that's the message. Josh, this question deals with children. How does PTSD manifest in people with childhood trauma or abusive parents while they continue to age and can it be treated? How do you recognize symptoms of PTSD in a child that has been abused versus other emotional disorders? Okay, so if, uh, the first question had to do with... How does someone... it manifest in people with childhood trauma as they age? Okay. So as they get older, sure. what happens to them? Yeah, person? so... Um... As, as I mentioned earlier, the PTSD symptoms, there's a lot of overlap between adults and children. Um, some of the differences in the presentation with children might reflect the fact that they can't necessarily verbalize what they're feeling or experiencing as well. So it might come out in um, how they play, they might um, have more diffuse anxiety reactions, and as they age and as um, they develop neurally, as they develop cognitively, as they develop socially, the symptom presentation can evolve. Um, so, for example, one way the symptom presentation might evolve is they might develop um, problems with relationships. Mm -hmm. um, as one example, a woman that I worked with um, had a very extensive uh, history of sexual abuse as a child. And it didn't really turn into PTSD for her until she became a mom herself and she was worried something was going to happen to her child. 
So that's an example of how, as someone ages and they encounter new stages in their lives, that the presentation of PTSD might change or it might emerge later, as um, Dr. Pine was mentioning. I mean, I think there's a so, second yeah, part so to that question. Yeah, so it could show up decades later. How do you recognize symptoms of PTSD in a child that has been abused versus other emotional disorders? Sure. So, uh, child um, to. Uh, diagnose PTSD in a child who's been abused versus some type of other emotional disorder. It might be strongly related to the cues for that anxiety. So a child who is generally anxious, um, there it might not be as cue driven, but for a child where the anxiety or emotional problems are more related to trauma, you might see that there's more reliable uh, triggers for the anxiety or there might be um, more problems sleeping with nightmares, there might be more um, withdrawal and avoidance symptoms of some of those situations or people that are related to the trauma. So that's one way that you might be able to differentiate a trauma specific uh, response versus maybe a generalized emotional response. Dr. Pine will direct this to you. Does a veteran of PTSD and a low GAF, I'm not familiar what mm -hmm. GAF is, 35 to 40, always know what they're doing and saying, what is their awareness level, can it be helped? Uh, well, I, I think, I mean, given that amount of information, I, I, I'm assuming they're, they're getting treatment. I'm assuming that, you know, uh, that uh, they're in an effective treatment. So, um, so I, I, the simple answer is yes. I mean, you know, the, the GAF, the Global Assessment of Function Scale that we use, um, basically that means that they're having significant impairment, you know, associated mm -hmm. with the symptoms. Um, but yes, I mean, we, we treat patients, you know, with, uh, you know, with GAF scores, you know, in that range with PTSD all the time. Um, so, uh, you, know, I would, you know, I would say yes, that uh, there are treatments available, you know, even with you know, a low GAF like uh, like this person mentioned. No, I would say probably in particular to a low GAF like that. That's a very low GAF. GAF goes what all the way the to scale? 100. Yes. Go okay, from to 100. zero to 100. Okay. 100, you are in perfect control of your life. Nobody is 100. <laughs> I was like, nobody's probably a good 100, day, you are yes. a 75. <laughs> but uh, 35 is very low. Mm -hmm. But so, but that person definitely has a lot of room, hopefully, to to improve from that level to a better level functioning. How do you score a GAF? Is it subjective or are there ways we to determine anchors. what level? We have anchors every 10. So you can be, it's usually 0 to 10, there is an anchor. Mm -hmm. And then you can, if you are in between 0 and 10, you get a 5. So you can have a range there. So we do have descriptors, 10 descriptors from 0 to 100. I also want to ask you more about medication. This question is, I understand that the drug ecstasy is being tested now with outstanding results. Could you please discuss this? Are there plans for this therapy to become available actually at the VA? So Dr. Pine, you may want to answer that one. Well, I am not aware of that one. Uh, the FDA has <laughs> given some labs in the country, a couple of labs in the country, permission to use ecstasy for, uh, for very strict control conditions in as clinical trials. So this is very early. We don't know yet how effective they actually are. We don't know how dangerous they are. And, uh, and so right now, as I know, there are a couple of, a couple of uh, universities in the country doing clinical trials on exercise for PTSD. But that's all. The FDA, as far as I know, has, has authorized just a couple of, of uh, groups to do it. Linda, going back to resources, this viewer lives in Washington County and wants to know if there are local resources in Washington County. Yes, there they are, and there there is. Um, and uh, if they would like to call um, 501-686-9164, that is DBHS um, main um, phone number, or they can call me at 501-686-9178. They will reach me personally, and I will refer them to what services are available in their area. Dr. Pine or Dr. Macias, either one, what can the public do to help? Or Josh, Ooh. or Linda, whoever wants to take this one. I'll take that one, is that okay? Go. Go. Well, we're, okay. we're actually in another, uh, another study that we're doing, that we're looking at engaging the public, engaging the community in helping to, um, if you will, like the, the video mentioned, bring the soldier home and help you know, reintegrate uh, returning veterans into their community. I mean, one of the things that I think that, you know, that we recognize is, is that, you know, as, 
as much as we want the you know the veterans to seek care at the VA we really want them to reintegrate with the community I mean that's that's the goal not to reintegrate necessarily with the VA although you know the treatment you know can be helpful uh, so so we are reaching out to uh, different communities actually in Arkansas and in other states to um, to educate them about um, about PTSD about you know the stressors and problems that uh, that veterans have when when they return from combat when they're uh, you know go back to civilian from military to civilian status and um, and what we're finding is that um, in at least in you know a, a good number of the communities that we go into there's a there's a there's a broad interest in um, in really helping you know the veterans mm -hmm. you know return home and um, and it's and it's been rather gratifying to try and sort of bring you know bring those groups which probably weren't talking to each other bring them together and then uh, and help them come up with sort of a game plan for how they can address the needs within their community so um, so that, that's been actually a, a very fun project to work on. Well, we only have about two and a half minutes left, but we want to go over one more time of yours asking the symptoms. Josh, if you can repeat the symptoms to us quickly. Yeah, so uh, there's a couple different categories of symptoms. One category is intense emotional or physical distress upon some type of reminder. So we call these re-experiencing symptoms. Um, another type of re-experiencing symptom might be nightmares. So the idea is that the individual PT with PTSD re-experiences the trauma and um, that elicits some type of strong emotional or physiological distress. It's avoidant symptoms, so the individual doesn't want to be around things that make them uh, think about the trauma. Uh, there's some type of changes in mood or cognition, so that might be depression and inab inability to feel love or joy, uh, feelings of shame or guilt, as we talked about earlier, and then hyperarousal symptoms where the individual might be hypervigilant for threat or overly concerned or looking out for danger. They might have problems sleeping, uh, concentrating, uh, irritability, or startle. So if you notice any of these symptoms in yourself or a loved one, you should definitely seek treatment, at least get diagnosed. Yep, at least see an assessment, yep. Okay, Linda, let's give that number out one more time for anyone looking for resources in Arkansas. Who do you call, Where? who do you contact? So um, DBHS certainly can be contacted and that number is 501-686-9164. Or Office of Consumer Affairs, um, which I'm acting in, um, that phone number is 501-686-9178. And um, myself or any of my colleagues would be able to refer any individual to the providers in their area that um, could offer services. Okay, and Dr. Pine, for veterans, the first point of contact when you go to the VA, where should you go? Well, um, you would need to register in the VA if you're not already, um, and, and that can be done um, actually at, uh, at any of the VA hospital in Little Rock or North Little Rock or at the community-based outpatient clinics that are scattered throughout the state. Um, any of those locations can, can get you started. Okay, well, we thank you all for being here this evening. Some great information, and thank you for being with us as well, and hopefully you have taken away some valuable information and you can recognize the signs and symptoms and get the treatment necessary. Thanks for joining us. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Changing Attitudes is underwritten by the Arkansas Mental Health Research and Training Institute.